The good news according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no and with his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The good news of the Lord. We're in, as you know, the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we've been in a uh, sermon series uh, looking at the different parts of Advent. We've had the Advent hope, the Advent peace, and this, uh, this uh, what is it, afternoon, I was about to say morning, this afternoon, uh, we're going to look at the joy of Advent, the joy of Advent. <clears throat> All right, let's see if I can do this. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth. Okay, I can keep going for the whole thing. We got joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their song employ. Uh, No more let sin and sorrow grow. Um, He comes to make his blessings flow. He rules the world with truth and grace and make the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Now, now, some of you who are old school Lutherans are probably wondering, why is he singing a Christmas song in Advent? Here's the thing, that song isn't a Christmas song. Isaac Watts wrote that hymn in 1719 and he published it in his collection, and this is the actual name, the Psalm of David imitated in the language of the New Testament and applied to the Christian state and worship. Yeah, they wrote some long names back then. Um, this song is a paraphrase of Psalm 98. Psalm 98 isn't about the coming of Christ. Watts and others believed it's talking about the second coming of Christ. When Jesus came the first time, the earth didn't receive her king. John 1, 11 says that he came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. The first time Jesus came, it wasn't as our reigning savior. Isaiah 53 proclaimed centuries earlier that he would come as a suffering servant, which he did. The first time Jesus came, it wasn't to reverse the curse. He came to atone for it. He came to to pay for it as a sacrificial lamb. The first time Jesus came, it wasn't to rule and reign on the earth. Jesus said to himself, my kingdom doesn't consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that, king, that kind of king, not the world's kind of king. The first time Jesus came, it wasn't like that. 
It's not what happened that first Christmas morning, but that, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't sing joy to the world during Advent. Even though Watts wrote the hymn about Jesus' triumphant return, it's still based on the joy that comes from Jesus' first time on earth. Advent, like that song, is like wearing a pair of trifocals. Some of you may be wearing trifocals tonight, I don't know. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with trifocals, and the first time I, he I heard about these, I was like, really? Wow. Uh, they're, they're glasses set up with three lens strengths. When you look through the top, you can see things far away. When you look through the middle, you can see things that are at a normal distance. And when you look through the bottom, uh, you can see things close up. That means you can look at the same thing and see it three different ways based on the lens you look through. That's the way Advent and Christmas are. Silent Night is a wonderful Christmas song because it talks about the Advent joy of Christmas past, the joy of that holy night when God came to earth wrapped in the flesh of a baby. Go Tell It on the Mountain is a wonderful Christmas song because it talks about the Advent joy of Christmas present, the joy of telling the whole world the, the good news of Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. Joy to the world... <coughs> excuse me, is a wonderful Advent song because it talks about the Advent joy of Christmas future, the joy of Jesus' triumphant return. That was loud. It's the joy. <laughs> and for the record, it's just water, okay? <laughs> it's the joy of when Jesus will rule and reign, removing the curse of sin and sorrow. It's the joy of when every knee will bow before Jesus and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So on this fourth Sunday of Advent, with Christmas just days away, I want to encourage you to have some trifocal joy. And when you look around you at all of the trappings of Christmas, you need to see three views of Advent and Christmas joy. All you have to do is look through three lenses. The first lens sees the advent joy of Christmas past. Now, now, most of the time, this is the only lens we look through at this time of year. Seeing Jesus as a baby in the manger, we see Mary and Joseph, shepherds and angels, sheep and cows and donkeys, and we even see these wise guys who show up at some point. It, it, it's a pretty picture, but I'm sure it wasn't what happened. Uh, when the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write the passage, it was 80 years or so after it all happened. Luke wrote the story as an overarching event, so the timeline is flattened. It wasn't as clean and nice a scene as the typical major scene today presents it. And they certainly weren't lily-white Europeans. Uh, they were dark-skinned people of Middle Eastern or African descent. But those aren't the details we need to focus on, and because they don't show the true joy of what happened that night. What happened that night was that God became flesh. John's gospel tells us why it was so joyful that night. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The little baby born in that manger was fully God and fully human. The baby was like every other baby except he was born without a sin nature. The baby was God in the flesh, conceived with the Holy Spirit and born without sin. Emmanuel, God with us, born to save his people from their sins. The baby was born to live a perfect and sinless life, endure every temptation, go through every disappointment, suffer every pain. If you don't believe me, read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 later. The baby was born to die a cruel death, a death he willingly went to in order to give you a relationship with God that you could never earn. No amount of personal devotion or sacrifice could ever give you what Jesus' death gave you. That's the joy that came to Bethlehem that night. That's the joy we sing about at Christmas time. It's the Advent joy of Christmas past, the joy of God coming to earth in the flesh, providing a way of salvation. 
But that's not the only view of Christmas joy. We know the Christmas story so well, yet too often that's where we leave it. Too often we leave the joy of Christmas in the manger way back then. When we do, we need to look through another lens. This one is talked about in our first reading, this, or our second reading this, this morning. That lens sees the advent joy of Christmas present. So take a look, another look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 22. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica, says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. The Advent joy of Christmas present. Not Christmas presents, but Christmas present. Christmas presents are fun, but too often the fun doesn't last as long as the payments. Uh, presents wear out, break, don't fit, or are just the wrong thing. Sometimes you get the right thing and the right size and everything, but it only takes a few weeks to realize it's not as exciting as it looked on TV. It's not about the joy of Christmas presents, but the joy of Christmas present. I realize that joy can be a difficult concept. People see joy and happiness as the th same thing. If nobody has ever told you before, let me be the first. Joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is all about the circumstances around you. Joy is about the feeling inside of you. Uh, some of the most joyful people I've ever met were going through some of the most miserable circumstances you can imagine. And then there are some of the most miserable people I've met um, who have had everything in the world going for them and yet still miserable. Joy isn't about your circumstances. Paul knew that. That's why he could tell the Philippians, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He could be at the top of the mountain and everything going great or beaten and battered and stuck in a cold, damp hole with only his underwear. It didn't matter to him. Paul had learned by the grace of God to be content no matter what was happening with, around him. So when Paul tells the Thessalonians to rejoice always, he means it. This isn't just some phony smile, God loves you uh, statement from some preacher with nice clothes and a fancy car. This is from someone who was in prison more than once, beaten more than once, and left for dead a few times. Still, he's able to say, rejoice always. He can say this because the one who came that first Christmas day gave him strength. Jesus gave him joy. Ge Jesus gave him contentment. The joy that Jesus gave him enabled Paul to live like Jesus wanted him to live, which fulfilled his joy. Now, you can look back on an experience in joy, but you're not experiencing joy right now. If that's you today, I've got good news for you. You can have the Advent joy of Christmas present. You can have joy in your life today and every day. If you want to have joy in your life, just look at verse 17. Pray without ceasing. In other words, have an attitude of prayer. Have times of the day dedicated to prayer, but always have an attitude of prayer. If you want to have joy in your life, look at verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. If things are going bad in your life, remember that God can work those things together for divine good. If, if things are going good in your life, don't take credit for them. Thank God for the blessing. If you want to have joy in your life, look at verse 19. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Ooh, Lutherans love to quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, when the Holy Spirit prompts you or convicts, convicts you, respond. Don't ignore it. Don't tell the Holy Spirit, oh, I'll do it later. Uh, don't tell the Spirit you have to do something else first. Respond to the Holy Spirit 
and do what you're prompted to do. If you want to have joy in your life, look at verse 20. And this is my favorite. Listen to the preacher. (laughs) When the word of God is prayerfully laid before you, you need to hear it. You need to listen eagerly and expectantly. You need to come with a keen, clean, hungry heart. I need to be honest. There have been times I've gone to worship somewhere and I entered as a, as a skeptic, knowing a little about the preacher or the church and wondering if the word was really going to be preached. Sometimes it wasn't. That's why Paul followed verse uh, 20 with verse 21. You need to test everything you hear against Scripture and theology. Don't just take the preacher's word as the gospel truth. Check it out for yourself. It's not about your opinion. It's not about tradition. It's not about your taste or or personality or preference. It's about Scripture and theology, determining if what's preached is indeed a word from God. And after you've lined up the preaching with Scripture and theology, Anticipate what the Word is going to say to you. Eagerly seek how it relates to you and work to apply it to your life. Hold fast to what is good. Remember, translation isn't an exact science. When the translator used the word hold fast in our text, that that was probably the strongest word they could come up with. But it's not strong enough. It's more than even clinging to what's good. It's holding on to God's word like a prison holds on to a prisoner. There's joy in holding fast to God's word in that way. There's also joy in avoiding even the appearance of evil. That doesn't mean you have to become a legalist, living every exact letter of the law. It means that you apply the teachings you're holding fast to, being sensitive to the Spirit's conviction. It means abstaining from pride by giving thanks to God for everything. It means abstaining from the sin of self-sufficiency by praying without ceasing. That's how you can have the Advent joy of Christmas present in your life now. Joy isn't fake happiness and pasted-on smiles. Joy is the overflow of Christ in your everyday life. That's the Advent joy of Christmas present. But there's still one more lens to look through. That's the lens that sees the Advent joy of Christmas future. Look with me at verses 23 and 24. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. I don't know about you, uh, uh, but I can think of no greater joy than the assurance that God is in control. Uh, I, I can think of no greater joy than knowing that God is working it all out. No matter what's going on in your life right now, God knows about it and isn't just sitting back wondering what to do about it. Uh, you might be, uh, but you can rest assured that God isn't. God isn't because God made you a promise. The creator and sustainer of the universe promised you that if you trust in Jesus, you will be saved. Not only will God save you, verse 23 says that God will sanctify you entirely. That means that one day God will make our posture equal our position. Okay, I I realize that's very much a black church phrase here, so I better break that down for you, all right? As a child of the king, we wear the robes of the king, but we're not kings. We don't look like kings, and most of the time we don't act like kings. Uh, But one day we will. God has promised that one day we'll all wear the crown of righteousness. We'll not only be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we'll be righteous even as Jesus is righteous. We'll be entirely sanctified. Our whole self, our spirit will be reunited with glorified bodies to form a new and eternal living soul, a new and eternal living soul that will be forever in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's joy in that. There's joy in the fact that God is faithful. There's joy in the fact that God calls you to God's saving grace and you respond in faith, believing. Verse 24 says, God's going to do this. That's 
the advent joy of Christmas future, the joy that comes in security, the joy that comes in assurance, the joy that comes in the faithfulness of Christ. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. It's time to receive your king. When you do, you'll have the advent joy of Christmas past. You'll have the advent joy of Christmas present, and you'll have the advent joy of Christmas future. Amen.